Okay, nice. We have a 30 seconds uh, delay before the time, but I'll, I'll follow my official timer. Um, I think, by the way, I think it was Karen. I think, uh, can, yeah, sorry, let me, uh, for some reason, sometimes it's automatic, sometimes it's not. Okay, so Karen is coming up. 30 seconds uh, delay before the time, but I'll, I'll follow my official timer. Okay, there you go. Now it's all okay. Um, Hello. Hi, guys. Hi, Karin. Where else? Yeah. <laughs> Sebastian is trying to argue with Bagdanov at the moment. This is not going to work. <laughs> That's so sad. That was a very sad, you know, I think I think for Bagdanov, the, the earth rotates faster than it used to. <laughs> Everybody stop writing papers, please. Okay. This is the whole point. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. I think we're almost so. Is Martin here by any chance? Uh, I don't see Martin. And again, I couldn't. Uh, it gets to Marcus. Uh, oh, yeah. Axel is there. I, I, should I promote Axel you know, to, to panelists? I think I should. I think I'm going to just to see if he's uh, awake. This is how much he loves you. Axel is actually waking up this early to to, to listen to you. <laughs> Where? Oh, I eaten my coffee already. Woo! Uh, yeah, good, good. You know. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so we're going to start. Um, so let me um, uh, welcome everybody uh, that is coming up here once again to, uh, to the uh, online Spice Spin Plus X seminar. I apologize for the ones in this Germanic community here in Germany that has to go so parallel with this meeting that we have in Bad Honef. Um, unfortunately, that couldn't be helped. Um, once again, this is a Zoom webinar format. Uh, organized, uh, these seminars, of course, organized, as I mentioned before, in all of them by myself and Karen Everso City here in Mainz in the Spin Phenomenon Interdisciplinary Center in collaboration with the Spin Plus X. Collaborative Research Center led by Martin Ashleyman, Borka Hillebrands, and Matthias Chloe here in Mainz. We have very nice uh, talks uh, coming up. This one is actually uh, not updated, I can see, because next week uh, Achim Ross will be giving the talk, uh, also at 3 p.m., a uh, very exciting talk, and I encourage you guys also to come, please, uh, to the talk. Uh, but today we have, uh, I'm very, very pleased uh, to have uh, uh, Marcus Gast as our guest. Um, yeah, Marcus actually um, obtained his uh, doctorate from uh, Karlsruhe, where he's now back as a full professor there in the uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology uh, and was a postdoc sometime in Minnesota and has also connections uh, uh, with, with uh, um, Cologne, uh, where he's drawn a uh, work uh, often in magnetic skirmion physics that he's very well known for, uh, but also has beautiful works on strike or the electron systems and quantum phases and transitions uh, that would probably not be the thing that he talks about today. Uh, so please uh, go ahead, uh, Marcus, and uh, uh, you can uh, share your screen and begin your talk when you can. And, uh... okay. So you can see my screen now? Perfect. So go ahead and you can start anytime. Okay, uh, thanks, Haro. So, uh, thanks also for this uh, really uh, uh, wonderful opportunity here to, to present our work uh, in this uh, SPICE channel seminar. Uh, I, will talk, uh, I will be talking about uh, magnetic skirmion strings, um, uh, how they bend, twist, and vibrate. So, we, we um, uh, worked a lot on, on uh, trying to understand the dynamics uh, of uh, these objects, uh, but uh, I will start slowly uh, with an introduction to magnetic skirmion strings, uh, the main topic of my talk. Um, then uh, I will give you an overview over the linear spin wave dynamics of skirmion strings in various materials. So this uh, part will involve experiments. Uh, so I will uh, give you uh, an overview of uh, our endeavor to compare theory uh, with experiments uh, in uh, materials that houses these skirmion strings. 
And then uh, actually the rest of my talk will be uh, more theoretically oriented. And in particular, I will um, concentrate on uh, a discussion of the low energy theory of a single skirmion string. And I will uh, argue that interestingly, uh, such a string actually um, supports solitary waves quite similar to vortex filaments and fluids. And finally, I will also uh, discuss the influence of uh, spin currents on skirmion strings. But let me uh, start with an introduction uh, to magnetic skirmions. Um, so uh, we are concerned here with, with uh, uh, Heisenberg magnets in two, uh, in two dimensions. And um, for such a system, there uh, exists uh, uh, topologically non-trivial textures that can be characterized by a winding number. Uh, that means an integer number W. Um, here you see such an example. This is uh, um, known in the community as a nail skirmion because the spins, they wind in a manner similar, uh, as sim uh, very similar to, uh, well, as you find the winding in, in nail walls. And, um, and this has a, uh, is characterized by a by a, a winding number uh, because there is a non-trivial topological non-trivial mapping from the two sphere. This is the order parameter manifold from for the for the classical spins to the two-dimensional plane. Um, so um, the, um, so mathematically formulated uh, is a non-trivial homotopy group that um, uh, is uh, equal to the integers, and so this means there are actually winding numbers that belong to this integer class. And uh, these winding numbers can be evaluated by um, doing this uh, two-dimensional integral over this two-dimensional plane over a so-called uh, topological density, which is uh, depicted here. So, and this will be very important in the following. So we will see this formula uh, several times. So this m hat is a unit vector field. Uh, we will assume in the following that this will be a smooth unit vector field that uh, specifies the orientation of the magnetization. And there are these uh, two derivatives uh, and the cross product. This is essentially the, the solid angle that adjacent spins are, uh, are forming. And if you, if you integrate over, uh, you know, over this two-dimensional plane, you're basically integrating over the solid angle of, of all the spins here in the plane. And because they are basically wrapping around the sphere, once you get four pi, and if you divide by four pi, you get an integer. So uh, that's, a, that, uh, that's the, the, the intuition why, why uh, this is actually uh, making sense. So you have a a winding number that characterizes these textures. Good. So what is a, this, this is a skirmion. What is now a skirmion string? Well, uh, now we are considering a Heisenberg magnet, magnet in three dimensions and uh, assume that in a certain cross section in, in, in this three dimensional space, we have a skirmion texture. Uh, this texture can then be um, continued uh, along a line in the third direction. And this is what we are calling, what, we'll be, what we will be calling skirmion strings. So an extended object, uh, uh, an effective one-dimensional object, um, and each cross-section of this one-dimensional object contains actually a skirmion texture. So this is, uh, you know, this, this should represent here the skirmion string. So this is the extension in the third direction. And in each cross section, you have such a texture uh, present. Good. So this is not just a, a theoretical curiosity, but actually uh, they can be found in experiment. Uh, and uh, and um, one, uh, my, one of my favorite compounds where you can find them is actually the cubic chiral magnets. Um, so uh, uh, this is the phase diagram of cubic chiral magnets. And there is a little pocket here at finite magnetic field and close to the critical temperature where um, uh, the, crown, the magnetic crown state is actually um, a hexagonal lattice of skirmion strings. So the, the, st the skirmion strings, they condense into a hexagonal lattice. Um, they are aligned with the applied magnetic field and perpendicular to the, uh, to the field, they form uh, a hexagonal skirmion lattice. 
Um, so this was um, experimentally first um, uh, identified uh, approximately 12 years ago. So, um, and there are now, of course, uh, many other materials where similar textures have been found. I will not give you a comprehensive overview, uh, but uh, I will focus rather on these aspects um, that are important, that are of interest for my talk. Good. Um, so what is the, the theoretical model that describes uh, these cubical magnets? Um, this, um, this is also, you know, this is basically the theory. Uh, it's rather simple, and that's also uh, one of the reasons why uh, I like them so much, because uh, in the limit of small spin orbit coupling, there are essentially very a few terms only that are relevant for the magnet for the for for the um, for the forming of the magnetic texture. This is uh, the uh, um, the exchange interaction characterized here by an exchange constant A. There is a chelyshinsky moria interaction. This is um, allowed because the system is non-centrosymmetric. So there is a uh, it's a, it lacks inversion symmetry and a DMI is, uh, is allowed. And then you have finally Seaman energy that aligns the Skirmian strings, for example. And, um, and the competition between exchange and DMI is actually um, uh, uh, stabilizing magnetic textures with the typical spatial wavelength that is given by the ratio of these two constants, so A divided by D. So if the chelyshinsky moria interaction is weak, that is the case in the, weak, in the limit of weak small orbit coupling, we get textures with a very large wavelength. So helices, for example, which with a very large uh, wavelength or skirmion strings, uh, where the winding is also happening on a rather large wavelength. Good. So this, uh, this uh, is my very short introduction. Uh, I now would like to give you an overview uh, uh, about what we know um, about the linear spin wave dynamics of such objects. And, um, and I should rather start uh, when, I, when, I, when I will be talking about uh, skirmion dynamics, I, I eventually talk about magnetization dynamics. And magnetization dynamics is uh, essentially precession. Uh, the precession of a magnetic field of the, of the magnetization in an effective magnetic field uh, that has to be yeah, that is an effective field, uh, meaning that uh, this effective field is determined by the magnetic texture itself. So uh, it can be obtained by um, uh, a functional derivative of the, the energy functional that is actually uh, responsible for, for the formation of this texture and which I have presented before. Um, yeah, um, to discuss uh, the linear spin wave dynamics, one essentially linearizes this equation and looks for uh, eigenfunctions and um, eigenvalues. And uh, this is what you get for a skirmion string lattice. Uh, so um, the skirmion string lattice is a complicated object. And so uh, for that reason, also the spin wave spectrum looks a bit complicated, but uh, uh, I will walk I will um, walk you through. So uh, first of all, um, let us concentrate on uh, spin wave wave vectors that are actually in plane, uh, in the plane of the skirmion, of the skirmion lattice. So this is the applied magnetic field. Uh, sorry, there is an H missing. Uh, and we are now, um, that is aligned, you know, the skirmion strings are aligning with the field and, and we are now focusing on a wave vector that is perpendicular to it. And, um, and then uh, one can uh, ask the question about the spin wave spectrum. And this is, and, and this is how it looks like. Uh, we have a periodic system. Um, and this means we have an effective hexagonal magnetic prion zone. And um, because we have a periodic systems, also the spin waves will actually prac scatter of this periodicity and the uh, spectrum backfolds and you get a magnon band structure. So in principle, this uh, skirmion lattice is a natural magnonic crystal, and you get actually naturally band gaps uh, where spin waves are not allowed to propagate because of prax scattering. Um, so this is how it looks like the first couple of bands. Um, one, interesting, uh, um, one interesting aspect is that uh, because of the non-trivial topology of the skirmions, also this, this band structure has a non, 
a topologically non-trivial character. Uh, so this is reflected in the churn numbers that one can associate to these Magnon bands. Uh, so uh, it, uh, especially at high energies, they are uh, non-trivial, they are finite. And this is uh, related to the so-called emergent electrodynamics that, um, that uh, spin waves uh, experiences when it travels across such a skirmion texture. So effectively, uh, each skirmion will act as a source of an emergent magnetic flux uh, um, of which the spin wave is, uh, is scattering. And this leads um, effectively to the formation of Magnon Landau levels. Um, this is a very interesting uh, topic by itself. Uh, so uh, I will not have time uh, uh, to focus on on, on this emergent uh, Magnon electrodynamics. I could give a separate talk actually uh, about this topic. Uh, so, uh, because I, today I would like to focus on something different, uh, rather on the, on the low energy dynamics um, that uh, one encounters in these materials. Good. Um, so, um, how do these modes uh, look like? Uh, here, I, I uh, give you an impression about the Magnon normal modes. Um, so the lowest energy mode is the Goldstone mode. Um, this is because the skirmion lattice is breaking and translation and symmetry. So you get basically phonon excitations that are the Goldstone mode. Then the second band, this corresponds to an elliptic distortion of uh, a skirmion in a, in a unit cell, which then uh, rotates, in the, in, uh, 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 rotates as a function of time. So what I'm depicting here is uh, uh, the, the deformation of the ground state in the unit cell and its evolution as a function of time at the gamma point of the prion zone. So the second band, for example, is a so-called counterclockwise mode. This is uh, particularly important because this is, um, this is accompanied by an oscillating macroscopic dipole moment. So this means the counterclockwise mode can be probed in, an in a magnetic resonance experiment. And the same is true actually for the breathing and the clockwise mode. They also come, uh, they are also um, accompanied by a macroscopic uh, oscillating dipole moment. And so they can be uh, excited in magnetic resonance experiment, which has been, which was uh, first pointed out by Mochizuki uh, almost 10 years ago. And subsequently these modes have been um, observed in various compounds. Uh, you also have other modes that are actually um, not active, so they are, you know, they, they don't have an oscillating dipole moment, for example, like this uh, sextopolar mode or this octopolar mode. Uh, and usually they, you know, you, you need to, to work a little bit harder in order to see them in experiment. So this is how the, the frequency as a function of magnetic field looks like. Um, so the, the breathing mode, for example, its frequency decreases as a function of applied magnetic fields, whereas the other modes, their frequency increases. Um, yeah, as I said, there are a couple of experiments uh, that have actually quantitatively verified these theoretical predictions. Uh, here, I would like to present you a new uh, new data uh, together, you know, which we a collaboration which we did with Rina Takagi in uh, Professor Seki Group in uh, Tokyo. Uh, this is a, a new measurement uh, on copper selenide oxide. So what you see here is um, the spectrum. So this mode is the breathing mode. Uh, this is the counterclockwise mode, and this is the clockwise mode. Uh, this is uh, in the skirmion lattice phase of copper selenide oxide, but uh, it was actually very carefully prepared. And uh, you see actually new features. For example, here you see a nice hybridization. And this hybridization is actually uh, located at an accidental degeneracy between the breathing mode and the octopole mode. So there is, as I uh, mentioned, there are dark modes, which are not usually not active, to uh, magnetically active, but um, but uh, here uh, this dark mode is crossing this breathing mode, and now it happens that if you switch on a little bit of weak magnetocrystalline anisotropy, which breaks the rotational symmetry, these accid accidental degeneracy are lifted and the modes hybridize, and uh, and then and then these dark modes become actually visible. And this is here uh, happening for the breathing mode and the octopole mode. So this is a calculation which nicely reproduces this hybridization between the breathing mode and the octopole mode. 
the octopole mode, how it looks like is depicted here. It's, um, you know, it's an octopolar deformation of the skirmion lattice that rotates as a function of time. Uh, if you carefully uh, look, you also can confirm actually a, a hybridization between the counterclockwise mode and the sextopole mode, which is, which is also predicted theoretically and verified in the experiment. But the hybridization gap is not so large as compared to the octopolar leading mode. Good. So um, now I would like to uh, discuss uh, how these spin waves look like if you um, have a spin wave that propagates actually along the skirmion strings. So this is the, again, the skirmion string lattice. And now I'm concentrating on wave factors along the string. And then you get a, a spectrum like that. That is the theoretical spectrum. And um, it's a lot of spaghetti, but what is actually, in, what is striking is that it's characterized by a very pronounced non-reciprocity. So this means the spectrum is actually not symmetric. Uh, this is actually quite common in uh, systems like in inversion symmetry, which have a spin orbit coupling and a Chiruzinski moria in uh, uh, coupling. And uh, here you see it actually for the magnetically active mode, counterclockwise breathing and counterclockwise mode. And you see that the counterclockwise mode in particular has the largest non-reciprocity. Um, this has been uh, experimentally investigated uh, by um, Professor Seki in Tokyo with the help of spin wave spectroscopy. So he checked the non-reciprocity uh, in, uh, the, in the skirmion lattice phase of copper selenide oxide by, by looking at spin waves that propagate uh, parallel or anti-parallel to uh, the skirmion strings. And uh, he, what you see here uh, in the lower panels is uh, the frequency that is recorded in the experiment uh, for, um, for spin waves that, um, that uh, travel parallel to the field. This is uh, the blue curves and the spin waves that travel anti-parallel to the fields. This is the red curve. And you see when uh, these uh, resonances differ, then uh, basically uh, you have a strong asymmetry, uh, meaning a strong non-reciprocity. And as predicted in uh, theoretically, this uh, non-reciprocity is uh, most pronounced for the counterclockwise mode. Uh, you can do this, uh, you can do a more, a quantitative uh, uh, comparison between theory and experiment. I refer you to this paper, uh, to our paper, if you're interested in, but you basically get very nice agreement between theory and experiment. There are more uh, experiments, uh, in particular in elastic neutron scattering. So we are collaborating with our experimental colleagues uh, uh, on comparing um, inelastic uh, neutron scattering spectra collected from various detectors in the world um, to uh, theoretical predictions. And um, this data, however, is not yet published, so I, I will not present it to you, but basically I can tell you that it basically completes the picture and, uh, and confirms uh, uh, the, the things which we know. Uh, so you can also make quite, uh, you know, get, get a decent, nice agreement uh, with all these various uh, experimental technique uh, and, uh, and what we know from linear spin wave theory and these cubic chiral magnets, at least in the limit of small spin orbit couple. Good. Uh, so um, uh, the rest of my talk, I would like to focus now on a single skirmion string. Uh, that forms in a field polarized background. So I, I assume we have applied a large magnetic field. So all magnetic moments are pointing along the field. But uh, then we are actually exciting uh, such a single skirmion string. And uh, we ask uh, uh, what uh, are its properties. So to be, to be concrete, I, I consider the following model. So I have a uh, you know, uh, a cubic chiral magnet with exchange DMI and Seemann energy. And it was uh, shown in a seminal work by Bogdanov and Hubert that indeed this model uh, supports such an excitation of the field polarized ground state. So a skirmion string um, that is aligned with the applied magnetic field. So first uh, one can again ask uh, about its linear dynamics or so the linear spin wave theory. And this is what you get. Um, so this is as a fun, this is the energy of the magnons as a function of wave factor along the string. 
So you get a continuum of spin waves that are basically the scattering states. But then you get subgap states uh, that are essentially uh, magnons that are bound to the skirmion string. So magnon skirmion bound states. So one is shown here. This is a breathing mode. Um, so here, uh, the, the radius of the skirmion is oscillating in time. And, this, um, and these oscillations can also propagate along the string. Uh, and this is the dispersion. Again, it has a strong non-reciprocity, non meaning if you, if you probe the, uh, the group velocity here, you get actually a finite value. Uh, here, this is a, a second mode. This is uh, the, a Goldstone mode. You know, the, the skirmion string is breaking translational symmetry. And so you have a, a zero mode that is um, related to this translation symmetry breaking. And, uh, and it has a quadratic spectrum, so it's gapless, and it has a quadratic spectrum at low energies uh, with a non-reciprocal correction that is, however, negligible in the low energy limit. And um, in the following, I would like to focus on this low energy limit. So I will focus here on the vicinity of very, very low energies where this spectrum of this translational mode is actually quadratic. Uh, I should also mention that uh, um, other groups have confirmed and also looked at this linear spin wave spectrum of a, of a, of a single skirmion string. Okay, so, um, however, uh, we actually want to discuss the, you know, the properties of this string beyond uh, linear dynamics. So, uh, in, in some sense, we would, we would like to, you know, describe the skirmion string in an effective low energy hydrodynamic theory. And for that, we, we need to know what are the, actually the conserved quantities of the skirmion string. And this is a very interesting question. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, I, I told you already that this low energy degree of freedom is associated with translational symmetry breaking. So uh, you, you might guess that it's, um, that it's related actually to, uh, to linear momentum. But uh, for that, you need to know what actually the linear momentum of a skirmion string is. And this I would like to discuss in the following uh, in some detail. So uh, there is a trivial conservation law uh, that is just uh, related to the geometry of uh, the order parameter, uh, which is just a unit vector that um, for, for a moment we, we restrict ourselves to uh, two dimensional space or we are in two plus one space time. And this smooth unit vector has a geometrical conservation law that's just, uh, you know, that's just because of its, um, just because it's a smooth vector field. Um, so if you look at the topological density that I've introduced before and uh, take the time, deriv uh, the time derivative, then you realize that uh, this is actually, that, that this can be compensated by a divergence of a topological current, which is defined here which has a very similar form, except that one of the spatial derivatives is exchanged with a time derivative. And, uh, and this obeys the continuity equation. Uh, and uh, it's zero, provided that there are actually no hedgehog defects. So basically, I assume that my vector field is very smooth. And this is just, you know, this is just uh, geometry. So there is no kinetics yet. Uh, it's just uh, the property of the of, of the, of the uh, uh, unit vector field. So what about kinetics? Um, for that, uh, you can look at this uh, topological current that we just introduced. So there is a, a, a spatial derivative and a time derivative. And now uh, you can replace this time derivative uh, with the landau lifshitz equation that actually uh, determines the the dynamics of this uh, of this magnetization, and for simplicity, in the following, I will just neglect damping and other complications. So we just take uh, the 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 pure Landau Lipschitz equation. And if you if you plug this Landau Lipschitz equation in here, then you can write this topological current actually as a divergence uh, of uh, a quantity, which is uh, the energy momentum tensor. So of the field theory. So um, for that, you have to use that if you take this uh, effective magnetic field and multiply it by a spatial derivative of the unit vector field, that this can be written in terms, yeah, provided that your theory is translationally invariant uh, as a divergence of uh, this object 
which here, because uh, these indices are all spatial indices, is nothing but the current of linear momentum. So this uh, has, so it looks like a conservation law, but it has a very strange form because it's not a continuity equation. So one can call it an anomalous conservation law for linear momentum. And this has led to a lot of discussions uh, uh, which are uh, also nicely uh, summarized in this review by Oleg. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, the ramifications of this anomalous conservation law, please have a look at this, at this publication. Okay, so, so how can this be used actually, uh, uh, this equation? Well, what we can do is we can uh, combine it, this anomalous conservation law, we can combine it with the topological conservation law. Uh, you see here, uh, in, uh, if, we, if, we, if we apply, uh, you know, if this is a, this is a vector uh, equation, if we take the divergence of this, and replace the divergence uh, with the topological conservation law. We get an equation which was first derived, as far as I know, by Papa Nicolaou and Tomaras, that says that uh, the time derivative of the topological charge is given by a double derivative of um, the quantity of this energy momentum tensor. And this is a very beautiful equation because it tells us that not only the topological charge is conserved, but also its first moment is conserved. Um, so because you have here a double derivative. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, and, and the first moment um, is, is depicted here. So you multiply the topological charge by uh, the position and integrate it and divide it by the winding number. Uh, and, and this object essentially you can identify as the linear momentum of the texture. And because it's conserved, uh, its time derivative uh, vanishes. So basically, uh, the skirmion, if there are no other forces, the skirmion cannot move. So it's just stuck um, uh, because of this uh, conservation law of, uh, of this form. Good. So um, actually, this gives now us a, a, a way to define uh, the skirmion string. So, um, you know, we define now the skirmion string in the following manner. We uh, calculate the first moment of the topological charge uh, for each value of, of the coordinate set that is actually uh, the set axis, which we choose to be aligned with the magnetic field axis. So in equilibrium, the string is aligned in magnetic field. And we can now, for each set plane, we can calculate this first moment of topological charge. And uh, we take this as a definition of our skirmion string. So this, for example, this is important whenever I show you in the following uh, numerical, micromagnetic numerical data, and I show you a, a, a red string, this is how it was extracted from the full three-dimensional micromagnetic data. So it's a collective coordinate that identifies the string. And uh, and this, uh, as I just explained, this can be identified with linear momentum. And uh, there is also um, a, a nice addition because if you take the square, so the absolute value, uh, then one can also show that this is actually related to total angular momentum. This was also argued by Papa Nicola and Tomaras, and, and, uh, we have, and we have elaborated on that in our publication a couple of years ago. So essentially, the total angular momentum is related to the second moment of the topological charge under certain conditions. Good. So how uh, does now the linear law energy dynamics can, uh, how can this now be understood in terms of our hydrodynamic uh, linear momentum formulation? Well, um, uh, this collective coordinate linear momentum obeys um, an equation that has a form of an effective Thiele equation for the experts. So um, this means that um, if you take the time derivative and multiply it cross product with a so-called gyro coupling vector, which is essentially a constant vector along the set direction, then um, this thing is, uh, you know, vanishes provided that there are no forces acting on it. However, if you have a string 
And uh, you know, the skirmions with, with in, in, in different planes are uh, displaced with respect to each other. They, are, they will actually um, uh, exert a force, uh, a restoring force, um, uh, which is related, you know, quantified by the stiffness of the string. So you get an effective stiffness restoring force, um, which is related to the curvature of the string. And the coefficient quantifies how stiff this skirmion string is. And uh, if you calculate, you know, if you calculate the spectrum from this equation, you just recover actually the quadratic Goldstone spectrum. And this is how this excitation, this linear wave excitation looks like. It's just a helical excitation of the string. Uh, you know, the stiffness, uh, this, this force, this restoring force wants to actually, um, you know, push the, skir the skirmion string back to equilibrium. Uh, but this peculiar dynamics here is actually enforcing then uh, that the, the string is forming a spiral texture. And these spirals then propagate either along the field, parallel to the field or anti-parallel to the field. So this is how the linear spin waves uh, look like that propagate along the string. So um, there's actually, it's, it's actually convenient uh, to map this behavior, I mean, to map this um, equation of motion to a Schrödinger equation. This can be easily done uh, by just introducing this wave function. So we have the collective coordinate, the position of the skirmion in a certain set plane. It has an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, and we can combine it to, uh, to a wave function, to a complex wave function. And then uh, the linear waves, which are just described, this equation of motion is nothing but the Euler-Lagrange equation of this Schrödinger-Lagrangian in a one plus one space time. And uh, what you see here, uh, you know, these, uh, these helical waves are nothing but the plane waves of um, the free, free Schröding Schrödinger equation, uh, because the plane waves if you plot them in real in, uh, as a function of real and imaginary part, they are, no, are nothing but some, some helical waves. Yeah, so you can think of it as a free part, a free plane wave of a Schrödinger equation, and which describes actually the low energy dynamics of our skirmion string, uh, uh, one by an effective one plus one uh, dimensional theory. Good, um, okay, but uh, we actually want to go beyond um, uh, the linear theory. And uh, so we can ask what, are, what kind of corrections can we add to this uh, Schrödinger theory? And, um, and there are strong constraints due to symmetries. Um, so first of all, we have translational invariance. So this means, uh, you know, whatever we add needs to involve a spatial derivative because uh, the wave function itself is the position and uh, because it, the system is translation invariant, it cannot depend on the position itself. Furthermore, there is a rotational invariance. I, I men shortly mentioned angular, total angular momentum. And this is actually, if you think about it, it's related to the U1 symmetry of the Schre Schrödinger theory. So this U1 symmetry is related to the total angular momentum of the Schrödinger string. So um, this restricts um, the terms uh, that are allowed by symmetry and uh, certain terms that are allowed on the linear level are depicted here. So these are higher order gradient terms, for example, a non-reciprocity correction, which involves three spatial gradients, uh, a mass correction or a mixed uh, correction. They are all irrelevant in the low energy limit because they come, they come along with higher order gradients. So they are all subleading in a gradient expansion with respect to the Schrödinger theory. So what about nonlinear corrections? So in the following, we want to consider the leading nonlinear correction that after proper rescaling can be put into the following form. So it's actually a nonlinear term. So it goes with psi, psi to the power of four but it's not uh, the standard term of a non-linear Schrödinger equation because um, you know, we, don't, we, are not, you know, we are not allowed to add a density, 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 density interaction because of translation symmetry. So, but what we can add is the derivative of the wave function to the power of four. And this corresponds to 
you know, uh, and and of course uh, we, you know, if we just try this by uh, on symmetry grounds to this Lagrangian, we don't know the prefactor. It could be positive or negative, but um, it turns out actually that um, it's positive, uh, meaning that's actually an attractive interaction. And this we checked numerically by micromagnetic simulations. So we, we and it actually considered non-linear waves. So the, these, these helical waves that I showed you before, but uh, we considered you know, um, them with large amplitudes. And what we saw is that the frequency of these non-linear waves decreases with increasing amplitude. And this essentially can be explained, this quadratic decrease can be explained by an attractive interaction of this form. So the sign we know from micromagnetic simulations, and there is also some hand waving argument why this should be attractive, um, but uh, we just take it for granted now from the numerics. And uh, this is very interesting because this attractive interaction, I would like to convince you in the following, supports, stabilizes solitary waves. Uh, this is how they look like. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, this is the solitary waves that we extracted from micromagnetics. Uh, so they are uh, certain, you know, they are localized excitations that do not disperse, but maintain their shape and travel along the string. And they can travel along either direction. And, and this is how they look like. And, um, and the beauty is that actually, we can derive um, these solitary waves analytically from the simple nonlinear Schrodinger equation that I presented you before. This is a more sophisticated um, representation of this solitary wave. So this is the skirmion string and the solitary wave is actually going through these cross sections. And, uh, and this area here shows the magnetization along the string and perpendicular to the string when these solitary waves go through, passes these cross sections. See, you can get an impression what actually this, the full three-dimensional picture of this solitary wave looks like. Good. Um, so far, numerics. What about analytics? So let's uh, consider this uh, simple, non-linear, one, one plus one-dimensional Schrödinger theory. So it's, uh, it turns out that we can actually solve the, for the solitary waves by, uh, with the help of the elementary conserved quantities of this, um, of this Lagrangian. And this is uh, first the density that is due to the U1 symmetry of, uh, of, the, of, this, Schrodinger the of this Schrodinger theory. And uh, I, I, I told you already this one, U1 symmetry is related to total angular momentum conservation. Uh, so um, this is one uh, symmetry which we have. And the second is the energy momentum uh, of this theory. And these two symmetries are actually sufficient to integrate the equations of motions. And uh, we can derive uh, some uh, simple uh, ordinary di differential equations that uh, actually specify um, the, uh, the wave functions for the solitary wave. So what in uh, precisely what we do, we make an ansatz for the solitary wave, which actually uh, corresponds to a Galilei transformation of a wave function that oscillates with a frequency omega. However, uh, because the theory is not Galilei invariant, uh, we will have a non-trivial dependence on this, of this wave function on the velocity, uh, which uh, is um, determined by these equations that can be obtained from integrating the conservation laws. So we introduce an amplitude and a phase, and, uh, and they obey uh, this set of equations with these type of functions. And if you solve that, this is easily solved numerically. And if you solve that, you find a two parameter family of solitary waves, characterized first by the velocity of the solitary wave, and then by the ratio of the frequency omega divided by essentially the kinetic energy uh, expressed in terms of the velocity. And uh, when this parameter is within the range of zero and one eight, we get a stable solution for this solitary wave. And uh, we even get a closed form analytical solution in the limit when this ratio goes to zero. 
uh, then uh, you know this describes the envelope of this solitary wave and this phase. Uh, the deriv derivative of this phase um, de uh, describes the coil density of this solitary wave. And uh, we can now compare with the micromagnetics. And uh, and this is a you know this is a scaling plot already, so it's a very sophisticated comparison between theory and experiment. So uh, extracted numerical parameters have been scaled already, and there is a nice scaling collapse. Um, so we expect actually uh, that all this data collapses to this uh, theoretical line in the limit of low velocities. However. Um, it turns out that the numerics is limited. Um, you know, uh, it's a bit difficult to get to lower velocities because when the velocity gets lower, the solitary wave, the amplitude grows and grows and it becomes bigger and bigger. And so we have finite size effects that then uh, come into play. But um, what we observe definitely is a trend that in the low energy limit, uh, these data is actually converging towards uh, the analytically expected uh, line. Good. Um, so we have, you know, we have a very non-trivial uh, magnetic texture, a one-dimensional skirmion string. And this string has a very non-trivial dynamic. So it supports actually solitary wave, waves that are propagating along the string. And now we can ask the question, is there maybe something similar in uh, uh, for other one-dimensional topological textures like vortex filaments that you see, for example, that you encounter in fluids. So here is a, a particular beautiful one taken from Wikipedia. Uh, a vortex, uh, in contrast to skirmions, you know, skirmions are smooth textures. Uh, in contrast to that, vortices are singular defects. And for that reason, they are in, in general described by a non-local dynamical bio savar law. And, uh, and this leads in particular to waves that propagate along these vortex filaments, uh, so-called Kelvin waves, you know, Lord Kelvin investigated these waves that have a non-analytic dispersion because of this non-locality. Uh, so it has a, a quadratic with a log correction. However, if you make uh, the um, approximation of, a, um, you know, that you enforce a local dynamics, so you make the so-called local induction approximation, you can actually um, describe the dynamics of these vortex filaments by an equation which is known as a Darius equation, which was derived, uh, you know, 100 years ago uh, by Darius, uh, uh, which involves the time derivative of the collective coordinate and derivatives with respect to the arc length of the filament. And interestingly, this Darius equation is integrable. Uh, it's an integrable equation. And it was shown by Hashimoto in the 70s that it supports solitons. And uh, there is actually uh, also an experiment published in Nature in the beginning of the 80s that uh, actually claims to have observed this Hashimoto solitons uh, propagating along these vortex filaments. And in the following, I would like to argue that actually these Hashimoto solitons are quite similar to the solitary waves that, that I have introduced before, uh, because uh, it turns out that this Darius equation can be also mapped to a nonlinear Schrödinger equation with a Hamiltonian that is essentially given by the length of the string. So this is a Hamiltonian with a density that is essentially given by the square root. And if you think about it, this is essentially the measures the length of the string. And so uh, in this approximation, the Hamiltonian, uh, this conserved quantity is essentially the, the conserved length of the string. So you, you neglect stretching. However, if you now do a Taylor expansion uh, in, the, in the limit when this intrinsic curvature is small, uh, you obtain you know, this effective uh, Hamiltonian density, which is essentially equivalent to to what, uh, what I discussed before. So this means this low energy Schrödinger equation that, that governs the, um, uh, the skirmion string is, ex uh, is essentially a, a, a limit of this integrable model uh, that is equivalent to the Darius equation. 
So this means that uh, you know if you have uh, if you have uh, two solitary waves propagating along the skirmion string and they collide, um, one would expect that they behave almost like solitons because you know they are very close to an integrable theory, and uh, and uh, and this is a cartoon uh, simulation. You see when they collide, um, they, it, they they radiate a little bit of magnons. Uh, but actually not much uh, because uh, they, you know, the system is almost integrable. Good. Um, so I'm almost, uh, you know, I, uh, this is, uh, I'm at the end of this solitary wave business. Um, now I have uh, a couple of minutes left actually to, uh, um, to just discuss a little bit how these strings actually act, you know, react in the presence of um, of uh, um, a spin current. Um, you know, uh, one possibility to include a uh, spin current is um, the following phenomenological description. Uh, it's a lambda Lifshitz equation in the presence of a Gilbert damping and the so-called uh, Tsang Li spin transfer torque. You have an effective spin current um, uh, which couples to gradients of the magnetization. Uh, there are two terms, one adiabatic term and one non-adiabatic term, uh, and the latter is also quantified by the, by the parameter beta. Now, you can ask the question, well, if the current is flowing perpendicular to the string, uh, what is actually, what is, the, what, is, what, what is the string doing in this case? And this is a situation that has actually uh, excited the community now for 10 years because uh, you can then uh, derive an effective Thiele equation that describes the motion of the skirmion string in this case. And what you ob obtain is um, uh, a motion, a skirmion motion that involves a skirmion, a skirmion hole effect. So because you have a non-trivial topology, what you find is that the skirmion move not along the current, but also a little bit transversal to it. And here I'm showing uh, uh, experimental data from, um, from the Argon group uh, that has uh, demonstrated this uh, skirmion hole effect. So this is um, by now very well known, but now you can also ask the question, well, if you now have a current which is not flowing transversal to the string, uh, to the string but along the string, what is happening in this case actually? Well, in this case, um, uh, you know, uh, the spin transfer torque that coupled to the current effectively couple to the gradient of the collective coordinate of the string. So this is the effective Thiele equation. You, you arrive in that limit. And so these uh, Sang Li torques, they generate derivatives, which are now linear derivatives that compete with the string stiffness that is the force that wants to actually keep the string intact. And, uh, and now you can imagine that if you have something, a, a linear gradients competing with a, you know, with, um, with a, a quadratic gradients, that this system becomes unstable. And in fact, it immediately destabilizes the spin wave spectrum. So what the, what the longitudinal current is actually doing, it pumps the Goldstone mode, the translational mode, and, uh, and even at least in the absence of disorder, an infinitesimal current is actually already doing the job. And this is how it looks like in the numerics. So this is now a three-dimensional numerics. And what I'm showing you is only, you know, this collective coordinate, a spin current is flowing in this direction. And, uh, you know, and what you see is that the amplitude of this of this wave, of this helical wave, is growing and growing. Uh, so essentially, you pump the Goldstone mode, and eventually, you destabilizing the string uh, because the, uh, the you know when the amplitude becomes larger and larger, at some point the string destabilizes and breaks. So surprisingly, uh, while a spin current that is flowing perpendicular to the string just leads to our skirmion string motion. A uh, little bit of, of current that is flowing along the string is actually destabilizing it. And uh, with this, I would like to come to my end. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge all my collaborators. 
So we are working already now for quite some time on this topic. I have not presented you all the results uh, that I that we have uh, achieved with my collaborators, but here I especially want to point out the contribution from Volodymyr Kravchuk uh, and uh, Shun Okumura that this, this uh, theoretical work on the skirmion string and uh, collaboration with uh, Professor Seki, uh, uh, where I presented this non-reciprocity and uh, previous work by Dirk Grundler. And uh, with this, I would like, you know, this is the summary and uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm very happy answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Marcus. That was a fabulous talk uh, and amazing graphics, I must say. <laughs> totally envious of it. Um, uh, so there's going to be many questions, I'm sure. I will start. Uh, so all of the ones that ask questions, I'll promote you to panelists. Uh, so, Nicholas, uh, you're going to be appearing on panelists. And uh, please unmute, unmute yourself, Nicholas, and ask your question. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. All right, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so the uh, spin, when you said linear spin wave for this uh, skirmian string, so how is it done? Like one unit cell contains then like many, many spins such that they can like form a skirmian. And this is then like one unit cell and then you have the uh, periodicity along the string. Uh, okay, so um, what we did, we calculated this actually with the help of this continuum field theory. Mm -hmm. So uh, this means um, we did it uh, um, not, we did not, we, we didn't do it with the micromagnetics, but we did it with the field theory. So this means we have a, we have a skirmion string solution and we do just, we do just a stability analysis and look for uh, the eigenvalues uh, the modes that are actually actually excite, you know, are fluctuating around this um, around this saddle point. Ah, okay. And like from this field theory, you also got the excitations you showed in the uh, first part of the talk. Yes, exactly. So um, this uh, Magnon spectrum, which I showed you for the skirmion lattice, was also obtained within the field theory. So it was not micromagnetics. Uh, so uh, it was actually um, basically uh, a, a standard linear spin wave theory of this continuum field theory. Um, all the micromagnetics that I uh, showed were, were, was basically, you know, was uh, um, the classical was concerned ones, right? with this yeah, with right. this with this uh, nonlinear skirmion string dynamics. Okay. This was this Thank was done with micromagnetics. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. So, of course, please uh, uh, raise your hand if you would like to ask a question, and I will promote you. Uh, so, Felipe, let me go to Felipe here first, and then uh, I will have my question afterwards. Of course, but, uh, so Felipe is coming up. Um, go ahead, Felipe. Can you unmute yourself and uh, let me see how it's coming up? Okay. Don't know what happened to you. We may have stabilized there. One second. Uh, hello. hello. Can you can you uh, can you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Ah, uh, thank you for this very nice talk. It's very impressive. I would like to ask you how uh, if you can introduce the uh, uh, dissipation in uh, your uh, stream. Uh, uh, the soliton uh, dynamics, because in in the last uh, uh, dumping uh, regime you will uh, not have this, but I suppose there is a uh, range of uh, dumping that is possible to still have uh, such solitons. Can you yes. go? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so um, uh, if you if you uh, switch on damping, uh, this uh, solitary waves decay, and uh, and we have a discussion actually in our paper. So um, you can you can estimate it analytically, and you can compare it to numerics, and uh, and the discussion you find actually in in the paper. So yes, it decays, and however, nevertheless, for reasonable damping, you still get actually a decent lifetime. So it's not completely hopeless, um, you know, to hope that this might be observed sometime in the experiment. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you very much. Stavros, Stavros. Sorry, I may, may mispronounce your name. Can you? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm just. I, I understand that this psi, this psi function for the uh, second part of the talk, so to say, is more or less the in-plane describes the in-plane component of the magnetization. I would like to hear, but I think we didn't hear much about the in-plane component of the magnetization in the first part in the uh, breathing mode and the uh, rotating modes. This was mostly, the pictures were mostly about the perpendicular component of the magnetization. I would be interested to hear a few things about the in-plane component of the magnetization, how it behaves in these, uh, in these modes. Breathing modes and rotating modes. Is there something that can be said about that? Um, yeah, uh, well, um, so essentially, maybe I'm going back to this illustration here. Um, so, so uh, I haven't properly explained what I'm showing here. So this, uh, this color coding is actually um, the uh, set component of the magnetization. Okay. And um, and, uh, and it shows us, uh, you know, a deformed skirmion in the unit cell that, uh, and this deformation and the dynamics uh, is just related to this particular mo uh, mode that you have here in the band structure. So in principle, you know, you can also reconstruct the in-plane component uh, corresponding to these uh, magnon modes. So that's possible. Um, so, uh, you know, here you have an in-plane, you know, here around the, 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 the white line, the skirmions are, the, the magnetic moments are in-plane and you can essentially reconstruct how the in-plane component oscillates uh, for these various modes. So in principle, we have all this information available. Um, can you say but, something, is there anything interesting about uh, something one could pick up? About this or... um, I don't know. Um, mm. So the in-plane, I mean, what, what is for the counterclockwise and the clockwise mode, we know that the in-plane, the macroscopic in-plane component is oscillating. Um, for the other modes, uh, it's, uh, it, the, the macroscopic in-plane component is zero, but, you know, higher order angular momentum, higher order quadruple, you know, higher order multiple modes are oscillating, essentially. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, and that's the reason why you can only see the counterclockwise and the clockwise mode in the experiment, because, uh, you know, the experiment, at least in magnetic resonance experiment, is coupling to the dipolar, to the dipole moment. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Stavros. Let's uh, ask Igor uh, to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question, please. Go ahead and talk, Igor. I think you, you, we're not hearing you at the moment, but you're not muted. Okay. Seems to be an issue of Igor's uh, microphone. So let me ask you while Igor is figuring it out that uh, one quick question. Um, so in this case, in the strings, uh, Marcos, uh, when you have uh, many strings in your system, and how are they interacting? Or do you consider that they don't interact? Okay, so, so um, what I presented um, in the beginning here, for example, uh, this is the, you know, this is the phase where uh, the skirmion lattice in the, is in the thermodynamic ground state. Yeah. So this means actually um, their uh, distance is achieved by, you know, by a competition between repulsion and compression. Uh, the, you know, basically you get the lattice constant that minimizes uh, the chilozinski moria interaction in all, in the, in all the energies actually. So of course you have a repul. I mean, they they are interacting, mm -hmm. and and this you also see. Then at least this is the skirmion lattice where you have really a crown state of a of a skirmion string lattice, and this interaction is also reflected, of course, in the spectrum. Then in the excitation spectrum. Yeah. 
but my, no, but yeah, but it, it, in this case, is this is the logarithmic that they actually the interaction, or is it what is the, the, the dependence on the interaction? But uh, okay, so uh, you you basically here um, we are considering a parameter regime where they are closely packed. Okay. Yeah, so um, they are basically the distance is essentially on the same order as the as the radius of the skirmions as a diameter. Of course, you can also now ask the question if you just uh, take two skirmion strings uh, far, far from each other. Um, how do magnons, for example, mediate an interaction? Correct. Um, well. If, if, if here we considered actually, uh, you know, the case when the magnetic field is uh, a large magnetic field is applied. So this means the magnons, uh, the scattering states are gapped. So this means um, the interaction mediated by magnons will be short ranged. Okay. But uh, it becomes more interesting if you uh, go to zero field, you will not have stable skirmion string solutions, but you will have other topological excitations and uh, and then it's much more richer and you will also get uh, some yeah uh, some other interactions between these objects yeah. so igor i think you figure out uh, yeah no i think we still cannot hear you igor unfortunately i think your microphone does not seem to be working uh so let me ask uh, i think uh revas uh proposed revas here to the uh to the um, panelists. Uh, so Revas, can you ask, uh, unmute yourself when you come in? Uh, Revas, can you ask your question, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Marcos, for the inspiring talk. Uh, I'm sorry, I had to switch off for two minutes, so maybe the answer to my question was given already. But when you presented the Schrodinger theory, uh, the, the coefficients were fixed. Like you had one half and one eighth. Yes. Yes. So, uh, what what fixed them? Uh, okay. So so uh, this was just for convenience. So um, you can just scale uh, time, space, and mm -hmm. amplitude in order to fix all these coefficients. Oh, so they they can all be fixed. Uh, well, at least if you if you uh, limit yourself to these three terms and you rescale time, space, and amplitude, you can actually okay. fix them. And uh, you know this was done. Um, uh, uh, this was I mean the motivation was done in order to then compare actually with uh, with the with this exact with this exact theory uh, that. Um, you know, where, where the square root is nothing but, you know, it's basically the length of the system and, and it recovers, you know, um, it recovers the correct sign. So that's important. I mean, the, the, the coefficients you can rescale, but uh, it recovers the correct sign, meaning that um, this, if the length of the string is fixed uh, by this Hamiltonian, then um, this uh, interaction is actually attractive. Okay, right. thank you very much. Um, so we will give it ego one more try. Uh, any chance, Igor, to I don't not sure if no, unfortunately, if you may want to write your question in the QA, we can maybe ask him. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Igor. Can you hear it again? Try you can try it again to talk. No, I cannot not. Well, let me ask for now. I think it's actually having a Rolando, yes, uh, I have Rolando promoted, and then he asked his question. So, Rolando, can you mute yourself and ask a question? Uh, Rolando? I think he's. Uh... Yeah, Rolando, go ahead. I cannot hear you. Rolando. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So I, I have two, two questions. So the first one is uh, maybe a simple question here, but uh, you had a graph a few seconds ago of the dispersion of the spin wave modes, I guess, 
that show non-reciprocity between k and minus k? Yes. Can you, can you say why it's non-reciprocal? Ah, uh, so okay. Uh, let's uh, let's maybe just show the Hamiltonian. Um, so you see, uh, we start with a system which is uh, which lacks inversion symmetry. So there is a linear gradient term. So uh, I mean, this uh, already on this level. It should not be surprising that what you get is actually uh, not necessarily uh, symmetric with respect to inversion of the gradient of the k. Right. right. Okay. That makes sense. So my second question is: in uh, in your beautiful graphs of the strings, and you have these disturbances around the strings. What is the disturbance of? What ah. What is these little things oscillating? Well, these are uh, basically what you should think of them is, you know, you, you, you start with a string. Uh, maybe I'm showing a single string again. Um, so, uh, so you see, uh, you, start, you start with a string and then uh, in, in the, lin you know, if you just think about linear spin waves, this means you shake all spins a little bit around the equilibrium position. And if you do that, uh, you get uh, eigenmodes, and, and this is basically one of them. So by, by just rotating all spins a little bit, their collective motion is actually producing such a breathing pattern. Okay, but I mean, the, the string is not a physical string, right? So are you saying that the core of the skirmion is sort of like wiggling that way? I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, for this, for this particular mode, uh, the core is oscillating. No, I understand that as a spin wave mode. I'm asking about the string itself and in your simulations, mm -hmm. right? They have this sort of like a little, I'm an optics person, so that looks like a pulse of light yes as a function so, of time so probably i should show this one again yeah so this is now a three-dimensional this, this is now a three-dimensional oh, simulation and uh, what is shown in the main okay. panel is just this effective collective coordinate that allows to you know to see at once where the string is at the moment now i this is this explains it to me thank you okay thank you very much Okay, excellent. Um, so I think we're going to finish with that. Uh, Igor, unfortunately, uh, he asked a question of uh, how stiff, oh yeah, sorry, he has, how stiffness and velocities depend on the parameters of, initial, of the initial Hamiltonian? Um, uh, okay, so the stiffness uh, is a proper, indeed a property of the, uh, of the string. So it, 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 it varies, for example, if you increase the magnetic field, uh, the uh, the stiffness also changes, so it's a magnetic field dependence. The velocity um, the velocity of the solitary wave is um, is actually a, a, a parameter. So you can choose um, you can choose this parameter freely, and you get for each for, for each value of velocity you get a new solitary wave. Um, so uh, these solitary waves which we have found. Is, uh, there are two parameter solutions. One parameter is velocity and the other is angular frequency. And we can basically vary both of them within a certain range where the theory is controlled. But we get basically a two parameter family of solutions. Perfect. Okay. Um, let me see some more question. Second question, I guess the role of the spin is shorter than size of the skirmish. That's... Uh... I think it's a little more, uh, so I will let, because uh, it's not so clear what the question is, I will let Igor maybe contact you afterwards. I yeah, think. I, I think he's referring to wavelength, right? Uh, yeah. I guess yeah, wavelength shorter word. than, the, so high energy, high energy excitations. Of yeah, the, I don't think that's considered here because you had a dynamic uh, formula yeah, yeah, yeah. that you're considering, so. Yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> it's all long wavelengths compared to the rest. Um, yes. Okay. So with that, I'm going to stop the streaming and thank all the, well, I mean, right now, if you have left,